boundaries and resentment. You often hear them mentioned in the same breath. I often say that resentment is a boundary that you didn't set 10 minutes ago. Dang, that's so good, man. One of the hardest things is to, gosh, to accept a spouse for who they are, to ex accept a partner for who they are, to give up control over this like really important piece of your life, which is your life partner. I mean, these things are really scary things to do. So I, I think I think that's a big piece of it is how much we depend upon being in control for our sense of security. I do think that is sort of the big challenge as we really learn to trust that we're lovable and we're worthy. Is that when we start to speak up for ourselves, people will have reactions and we have to navigate that. I'm going to be honest, you're not ready for this conversation. <laughs> this is a very special human being. Just as my journey has unfolded, Dr. Kelly Flanagan is in the house with us today. He's an author, a speaker, a relationship coach, licensed clinical psychologist, and he has spent so much of his life dedicated to solving problems, deep, deep problems for people. He's been on the Today Show, Success Magazine. He's been featured in the Five Love Languages. Like I know you've heard of those things. He's got two books that are nonfiction. One is called Lovable and True Companions. Lovable, uh, sorry, those are, those are two different books. One is called Lovable. The other is called True Companions. I will share a story with you today about how Lovable changed my life. No joke. And he's got a national best-selling novel, his first novel, called The Unhiding of Elijah Campbell. And I got to say, this conversation is going to stir you up a little bit. It's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. We, we get to talk about control and what that looks like, the difference between being and doing and, and how things go in this pursuit of more to becoming more ourselves. Dr. Kelly Flanagan is one of the best. And we go back and forth in a way that I think is going to really create a lot of energy for you. I'm so excited to welcome to the show someone I've looked up to for a long time. To be able to share this in this format is nothing short of miraculous. This is manifestation at its finest. I'm here with Dr. Kelly Flanagan. I've been thinking about this a long time. I'm going to drop this conversation in with a story. I was going for a run in Baltimore. I was running down Falls Road, an old section of Falls Road that runs right next to the Jones Falls Expressway and the Jones Falls River. And it's fall time. It's bright out. The leaves are green. And there's a coating of leaves on the road. It's a two-lane road and cars come whipping by. So you got to be really mindful of where you're running. And it had just rained. So not only is it bright, but the, the leaves are sparkling. It's also slippery underneath. And I'm having to run a lot slower than I might normally want to. I, I run like someone is chasing me. I haven't figured out how to jog yet. But I'm running in this amazing foliage listening to a book called lovable yeah <laughs> in the middle gotcha. of this run i just start crying and i have to stop running and just kind of settle into what was happening and i think that the moment that i was having was recognizing that i had lived the majority of my life not believing that i was lovable and not even thinking that that was a, an, an obstacle of mine, not knowing that that was a, a piece of mine that I was navigating. I read this story that all started with a letter that you had written and like it just ballooned into this whole moment. Fast forward a couple of years later, you and I are leading a workshop in Tahoe and it was a really special moment for me to just kind of come face to face with you and have these conversations. And it's been really special to have dialogue with you and to think about collaborating and, and making some magic happen. But it, it all started with a run that left me sobbing and really mm. started the work of me digging into my own lovability, which has taken me a, a very long road away from, from that particular surface in Baltimore. Yeah. But it has been a hell of a journey. And I, I just have to start with a thank you for catalyzing so much change for me. Well, thank you for sharing. You've never shared that part of the story with me and that vivid imagery. I really appreciate that. Um, and it means so much to me that Lovable resonated with you the way that it did. And it sort of set us off on uh, on parallel paths here. And I'm so glad we connected. 
It's been really cool. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. If I remember right, and and the details are probably mistaken to me, but if I remember right, that that book was written, it started with a letter and mm-hmm. then it took you all yeah. the way to the news. And and I'd right. just love to hear a little bit about what was happening behind the scenes because that book changed a lot yeah. more than just me. Yeah, no, it's a thank you for for asking. So the it probably I would think of it in like three phases for me. So my sort of breakdown moment, like you had, um, my author was a guy named Henry Nowen, N O U W E N, a Catholic priest. Um, and I had gotten to a point in my life at the end of 2007 where I was burning out. Um, I was burning out in my career. I was burning my marriage out um, and struggling personally. And I'd sort of read all the self help books, um, couldn't couldn't find answers in any of them. And uh, and so I set a New Year's resolution. Right, I know, <laughs> set a New Year's resolution going into 2008 that I was going to quit reading self help books and I was just going to start to practice all of the sort of skills, mindfulness, meditation, contemplation, prayer, sorts of things that I'd been reading about. And, uh, and Henry Nowen was one author that I sort of kept on board as my guide through that. And one of the things I was aware of by maybe the beginning of spring that year was that I had this voice in my head. Um, and this voice was constantly telling me that I wasn't good enough, uh, that I was falling short in this way or that way. Uh, sort of an ongoing narrative, which I eventually in lovable call the voice of shame, um, which for a lot of us is just, it's so constant. We don't even realize it's there. We just sort of take it as fact. We are almost like merged with it as individuals. We just assume it's who we are. It sort of reminds me of there was a, there was an afternoon when my kids were young, I would trick them into being quiet by paying them a nickel for every sound they could hear. I just nice. had like you know, five, <laughs> nice. five bucks and I get like 10 minutes of silence. It was totally <laughs> worth it. Well, one afternoon I was, um, I was doing that outdoors with them and they'd heard all the sounds I could hear. Um, but we lived near a pretty busy highway, um, which they were raised next to. And I was like, you guys are missing one sound you know, a big one, you're not hearing it. And they couldn't hear it because it had always been there, this background hum of the interstate, right? And uh, and that, I think, is how for a lot of us, that voice of shame works in our heads. It's just always there. It's a background hum. And so you don't even think about it. You don't even begin to question it. Um, but in those practices in, in t- 2008, I was starting to finally hear that voice objectively and start to recognize that it wasn't it was this uh there was this learned voice in my head um and and then i had sort of my epiphany that summer um where i experienced my full self fully separate from that voice and fully separate from all of the versions of me that i've concocted in order to cope with that voice right um which in the lovable i end up calling our ego or false self um and so that really set me on a, a, a totally new trajectory a new journey of going well, if I'm not that voice in the back of my head telling me I'm not good enough, <laughs> and if I'm not all the versions of me I've created to cope with that voice, who am I really? Um, and it took me about three years to begin to get some clarity on that. And once I did, I realized I was somebody who'd always been passionate about writing and I'd never done any of it. Um, so I started to blog. I had a my first blog post that went viral was uh, titled Marriages for Losers. And it was about how uh, in marriage, if we can compete to lose rather than competing to win, we'll probably all do we'll all, we'll all do pretty well because we're sort of sacrificing our egos in the process. Um, but I started writing letters to my daughter too. Um, and one of them was about how she's inherently worthy of interest and her job in searching for a mate is to find somebody who knows that. So she's not having to constantly prove that she's interesting all the time. But then the second one I wrote was from the makeup aisle uh, of a Target store about how her, her really true uh, enduring beauty is on the inside, not the outside. And that, that letter went so viral that we wound up on the today show together. She and I, uh, on the orange couch there at 30 rock and, um, got connected with a great literary agent and, um, and then lovable began to form. What was her experience? Did you guys get to talk about what her experience was like watching this thing blow up? Did all dad of that. Her? She was, um, she had just turned, let's see. So it's 2000. She had just turned three at the time. 
<laughs> so, so no. <laughs> uh, so no. But what's interesting is just this past February was the 10 year anniversary of that. And I had not watched the video of us on the Today Show since like two hours after we appeared. I just went back to the hotel room. I watched it once. I was like, okay, you didn't make a fool of yourself. And then I never watched <laughs> it again. Um, and for the 10th anniversary, she and I watched it together for the first time. Um, and it was really a cool moment to get to, to well, I mean, I, I think sort of surreal for her to be like, I was on national television and basically I let everybody look up my skirt. <laughs> like she's playing with her legs, you know? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and just sort of a, a really special thing, I think for the two of us to sort of enjoy that again together from this perspective. Now she's a teenager, she's 14 now. Right. So, um, she, uh, she's immune to some of some of daddy's guidance now um and probably will be again for another 10 to 20 years until she wants to start listening again but it was very <laughs> yeah. very cool and special for us to get to watch that together hmm. well that that book has a lot of resonance with i'd say the interesting journey of entrepreneurship in my opinion the, mm -hmm. the false self Mm -hmm. certainly connected with me. And, and I imagine if, if you have not listened and you're, you're listening, you've not listened to or read lovable, you may find a lot of what we're going to talk about today, very relevant to you. And, and there's, there's something about entrepreneurship that I find fascinating. One, I think the question, who am I is a big one mm. because we are very good at creating and part of that creating and the creative mm -hmm. that is an entrepreneur is also the mask. It's yeah. the, the wearing mm -hmm. of the design of the architecture of like, so, mm -hmm. so, so good at that. But that's a big question. The other thing I, I think about when entrepreneurship comes up and, and sort of the thesis of a lot of our work, I'm sure a lot of yours is also this, like, tell me what you want when you get there. Hmm. Because my guess is that you're going from, from point A, hmm. you think you've got to go to point B hmm. and point B is like the net worth, the business, the build, yeah the success, yeah. the fame, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you tell me what you would do when you get there, you what you show me is that you actually want Z and you mm -hmm. don't have to go to B before you go to Z. They're, they're right. actually equidistant. You could go right, one right, letter right. to Z or you could go one letter to B. But if you go to B, you got to go all the way around the alphabet to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just curious, like if lovability has been a big part of what you've seen others are really hunting for Mm. in the way that they're pursuing success? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the it, it's the insight that you're getting at is sort of baked into almost every wisdom tradition we have. You know, you think of like uh, the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree and sitting there for I forget how many days uh, until he realizes he didn't need to sit under the tree in order to gain wisdom. He had it all along. But that's sort of like the journey that we we all have to go through to discover that Oh, the lovability that I was searching for in what I accomplish and what I achieve and what I earn and what I accrue. Um, it wasn't in those things. It was in me all along. Um, now I think what accelerates that process for a lot of successful entrepreneurs is, um, oftentimes until you get the stuff that was supposed to produce the sense of, of, of lovability, until you get that, you will believe you'll find it in those things. And so the, qu so the quicker you can become successful, the quicker you can attain the things that are supposed to deliver, and then they don't, the quicker you're going to get searching in the place where you can find that lovability, with, which is within yourself, right? Um, it's really hard to convince somebody who hasn't achieved their goals that those goals aren't going to deliver all of the internal peace and satisfaction that they hope. Um, and so, yeah, I... People say to me like, well, how do you, like, as your kids start to go out there and strive and try to accomplish their goals and believe that their goals are going to make them feel lovable, like, how are you going to like prevent them from going on that wild goose chase? And my answer is I'm not, I'm going to tell them to go on the wild goose chase as fast and as quickly as they can and accomplish everything that they are setting out to accomplish so that they can realize that it won't, it won't deliver on what they hope it will deliver. They're going to have to find that inside of themselves. Dude, that's a, that's a fascinating statement. Like I'm aligned with it mm -hmm. in many ways. Goals won't deliver the peace and satisfaction that you're looking for. And I'd like to believe that there's a way to interrupt, mm. to mm. recalibrate, mm. 
some of those goals sooner so that someone doesn't end up burning themselves out or, or mm. like I've just watched it happened to me and I've, it's now a part of our coaching business where right. people are at the plateau, they're at the burnout and, and perpetuating the goals in the same yeah. manner starts to have a big consequence. Right. But I, I also recognize the, the truth in that you almost have to fail so hard that you're like, wait a minute, is it, can I finally raise my hand here and, and accept mm-hmm. that there's another way? Yeah. What, like, what is that rock bottom for people? Mm, that's a good question. So, I mean, you're getting at something really important. I think it's Richard Rohr who says like, um, the, if it, if it was working, you would keep doing it. Right. And so something has to quit working. You know, we wonder like, what is the point of suffering? You know, what's the point of pain? Well, it's, it's a, it's an alarm clock and it just says, Hey, this path is not working out for you. Um, so maybe time to start looking for a different path, you know? And, and I think what all of us helpers are doing, I include you in that, um, is that we, we're, we're looking for what is the pain point at which we intervene to help people because it's at the pain point, right? Where someone realizes this isn't working anymore. Um, so for a lot of the couples that I coach right now, it's, um, what I often say is I help, uh, high achieving men make their relationships as successful as their businesses, you know? So for, for some of the couples I work with, the husbands have achieved everything they wanted to in their business and in their entrepreneurial ventures. And then they try to apply some of the same strengths and skills at home in their relationships and it blows up on them. Right. So that's the pain point right? That's where the transformation and the growth is going to start is trying to figure out that problem. Um, so I think, I think there are all sorts of, for me, it was, um, (laughs) it was, wait, I've trained my whole life as a marital therapist and a communication expert. Um, I have all the skills necessary to be, uh, really happy in my marriage and I'm doing nothing but making it worse. Right. Um, I'm starting for me really underneath that was I'm starting to see myself in my frustration, starting to pass my wounds onto my sons. Right. Like I'm so dissatisfied. I'm so disgruntled. I'm so discontented that I blow up here and I blow up there. And I'm starting to see that I'm going to create some of the same experiences for them that hurt me. So that was a pain point for me. So I, I gotta, I gotta do something different. So I think what we're all looking for is that pain point where we finally acknowledge more of the same isn't going to get us there, right? And that doesn't necessarily need to come at the peak of our success, but that's a pretty powerful one. When you've reached the peak of your success and you're still in pain, okay, I got to do something different. Um, but there are a number of different sort of pain points along the way where we can can get people's attention and help them as well. Yeah, I, I have a soft spot for people at the pinnacle of their success that are also in pain. Mm -hmm. I think there's, yeah, there's something that we paint them. We paint them almost as like inhuman as marble statues Mm -hmm. in whatever their field is. Uh, I was watching a clip like an hour ago. There's a a relatively famous footballer, uh, soccer player for those of you that are American, (laughs) uh, (laughs) famous footballer that he's now, he's, his videos are going viral. He's talking about depression and he's, doing really successful in the world cup and yet his family life is crumbling and he's at the, he's like battling depression. But, but I, I I really appreciate the rawness that comes with that Mm. lovable in many ways challenged though, the route there for me, it it really Mm. made me confront what, what was happening and what wasn't. And I think that at the core, I was experiencing this moment where I could not accept my own lovability and therefore could not Mm -hmm. accept my reality. I could not Mm -hmm. accept what was. So there was Mm -hmm. no way to change it. And we, Mm -hmm. we talk about this now in in the the five ways we get in our own way. Number one Mm -hmm. is not, not taking responsibility. And another Mm -hmm. way to think of not taking responsibility is not accepting. Mm -hmm. Now I've struggled with the beauty of accepting lovability, but I've also struggled with the more general theme of, of acceptance. I think acceptance is really, really prominently avoided. Absolutely. You can't yeah. change it. You got to accept it. Yeah. You don't like oh, it. Yeah. You got to oh, accept yeah. it. Like it's such uh-huh. a big theme, but like, wh- why do we run? Oh man, that's such a great question. One of my most formative quotes over the last several years, it's sort of like a life quote for me right now 
is that the opposite of control isn't letting go, it's participation. And, and I think participation with the reality of what is, is the deepest form of acceptance, right? Um, and we, from a very young age, we cling to a sense of control as a way to cope with, I think, um, with life, with uncertainty, with stress, with wounds, with pain, with trauma. Um, you know, animals have two ways of handling those threats, fight or flight, and human beings have developed a third control. Um, and acceptance is really the relinquishment of control. It's, it's a way of saying, in try, instead of trying to change what's in front of me or what's inside of me, I'm going to surrender to it. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to participate with it um, rather than trying to, to alter it. And, uh, and that is really, you're asking, when we do that, we, we, we are being asked to relinquish one of our, you know, one of our core defense mechanisms, which is staying in control. Um, I think it's really hard. It's scary. Um, you know, I, <laughs> one of the hardest things is to, um, gosh, to accept a spouse for who they are, right. To ex accept a partner for who they are, to, to give up control over this like really important piece of your life, which is your life partner. I mean, these things are really scary things to do. So I, I think, I think that's a big piece of it is how much we, we depend upon being in control for our sense of security. Yeah. My world of control is changing a lot. Mm. Um, my son is downstairs sleeping. He's like 20 mm. months. And, you know, as I, as I learn to prioritize and, and grow with him and learn to help him learn and relearn myself through the, yeah. the journey of fatherhood, like it, it has been interesting to watch the, what I would use as the word gambit mm. of acceptance take place. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like a Colosseum mm -hmm. with these small moments of, can I be present? Well, it's hard to be present if you can't accept. It's hard to be present mm -hmm. if you can't let go and surrender. And mm -hmm. yet that's what I want the most, but it comes with all these complications of like right. the house is destroyed and what's going on. And I'm trying to cook the right food. And is it the right food? Yeah. He's not eating the food. Like it just becomes this interesting yeah. inner dance that mm. I, I think I'm doing a good job of of not bringing to the forefront of my behaviors. It's just happening mm -hmm. in my head. But that I, th I also think that happens in business, where mm -hmm. when, when you start to grow in business, mm -hmm. you also have to surrender to the people around you, to your team. You have to let them go past you. You've got to get out of your own way and let let someone grow beyond your control and let them fail and let it falter mm -hmm. and let systems be yep. built without you. And I just find that the 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 biggest preparation i've had for parenthood is entrepreneurship hands down mm, yeah and wow, and powerful. only because it has showed me a lot of things about control and teams yes. and vision yes. and and presence and and all that and yes. still wildly wildly unprepared i just find that acceptance is one of those phrases that seems really easy and yet, mm. if you truly accept where you are, it's also the, the genesis of change. Well, so I think my that's, question, a, that's a that's a key point. Yes. Yeah. So, so from from here, right? If if we work really hard to accept, and we we can get over that hill that's uncomfortable and that breaks you down and forces you to let go of control, and and that allows us to then change it. Does that does that like cycle back to not accepting because we're 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 creating change again. Is it just like a, yeah, a cycle great. and pattern? I do think there's a, there's a, a cyclicality to it. So, and I think what you're getting at is, so let's take these two words, acceptance and change. Um, they map on to, to me, one, you know, we can view life and existence and our humanity um, through a number of dualisms or polarities. Um, I think for me, one of the most important ones is the being versus doing polarity. Um, the being mode of mind, which is fully present to what is with no desire to change anything, but simply to get to know it better, to participate with it, to accept it, to experience it. Um, and then the doing mode of mind um, or the doing energy of life, which is about change and transformation and improving and vision and purpose and um, getting from point A to point B. I'll say like 
Doing mode is about getting from point A to point B. Being mode is about being fully in point A, right? Um, and so what you're getting at here is that these are both very valuable dimensions of life, acceptance and control or change. Um, but one of the things we do know from the wisdom traditions is while they both have their place, generally we, we act and, and, and behave and do and change more wisely if we've created a little bit of space for being and acceptance first. In other words, you, you want to be acting to change something from an energy of, I would still be able to accept it if it didn't. You're going to be less desperate. You're going to be less compulsive. You're going to be less imbalanced, right? You're probably going to be engaging it more wisely because you've taken the time to fully get to know it and understand exactly what it's capable of, what people are capable of, who they are, what they want, what they don't want. So we want to create the space for being in acceptance and then wisely act from that space to control things and change things. So they both have their place, but we want to get them in the right order. And then you make your changes and then you better pause again and go, what, what do I have now here? <laughs> Let me get to know that, you know, this new thing or this, what's my relationship like now? I, I got to tell you some of the biggest problems I've created in my marriage is because I went through a period of being and acceptance and then things changed quickly and our relationship transformed and I never hit pause again to go, what are we now? What does she need now? How has she evolved? How is it different? Right. Um, so I think the cyclicality and rhythm to it is, is really important. We could change better if we just stop and pause. Yeah. 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 Pause, pause, uh, pause now for wiser progress, you know, in, yeah. in the very near future. Right. And, and that's the interesting thing. Like you talk, you bring up lovable I talk about these different phases of this, this thing for me. I mean, the period of time around, uh, the, the beginning of my writing, the writing of lovable was about deep acceptance of who I am. Right. And when I discover who I actually am, I'm like, Oh, I want to write now a few years down the road, I've published three books. I've got another novel in the can, another, you know, another book coming out. Like you can't argue that acceptance leaves you static and unchanging. Actually, you start to see that really patient acceptance leads to the the most radical sorts of transformations and growth. Mm -hmm. It's it's not it's not a giving up or a surrendering. It's a going deeper in to and a wiser sort of change. I, I use the metaphor often with entrepreneurs around, especially our audience, who are looking for something deeper, who are also in the pathway of growth, and I. I use the metaphor of them being a hot air balloon. And at a certain point, you can't really flood the hot air balloon itself with any more air, with any more heat. It's already ready to go. The thing to do is to shed the anchors. And the way I hear you speak about acceptance and some of these things is, is and change in general is that in some ways, this deep acceptance is almost the anchor where you don't have to pretend anymore you're just allowed yeah. to lift. Like yeah. you don't have to fight so hard. Here's I mean, a big surprise for me. I talked about that voice of shame in the background that you're not good enough voice, you know, that you could see as sort of an anchor um, in a sense, like it keeps the, the hot air balloon from lifting off. The big surprise for me along the way is that you need to accept that voice too, because it never goes away. Right? Like it's it, at the beginning I thought, Oh, discovering that you're lovable means that voice is silenced for good. And the reality is like, once that voice is developed in you, you know, you can't, you basically can't uncreate what's been created. Um, can't, can't destroy it or annihilate it. And so now it's along for the ride. And so when it shows up, you know, if you, if you're in a, if you're in an energy of control and change, that's a very, it's a very demoralizing moment when shame shows up again. You're like, I thought I got rid of you. I love myself now. You're not supposed to be here. But if you've accepted even that part of you, you go, oh, I didn't, I didn't really want to spend this week with you in my head chattering away, but I can accept that this is how we're going to do this week. And I'll probably learn things from it that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. And, um, it's just, it is remarkable to me to wake up on a day where that voice is going. And I'm just like, I was in a really good mood when I went to bed. Why did you have to show up with me today? Um, but, and if you read lovable, you know, um, 
I'm, I'm a, I've become through my own journey and through the journeys of my clients, a big believer that we carry around previous versions of ourselves within us, you know, various versions of our inner child, so to speak. And so one of the things I've come to believe is that the voice of shame is actually my inner child too. It's that version of me that started to pick up pain and wounds and messages about my worthiness. And so if in the middle of hearing that voice of shame in my head now, I reject it, I'm just rewounding that part of me. Instead, if I can go, man, I'll, I'll spend all day with you if that's what you need. Um, you're needing attention right now for some reason, no problem. Like you've got it. We'll do today together. Right. So I, it's a very accepting approach to that voice now for me, instead of a, I want to get rid of it and change it. So here's like a practical tactical question for entrepreneurs. I'm a big mm -hmm. believer in name the voice, give it yep. a name and let's yep. segregate it from the best version of you. So mm -hmm. my guy's name is Bruce. Bruce sucks, right. <laughs> but Bruce is great. You know, I, I like that Bruce is Bruce. But I don't like Bruce's <laughs> commentary very often. <laughs> how, and how did you come up with Bruce? How did you come up with uh, Bruce? From Batman. And, oh, there you go. Love it. So I was a big okay. Batman guy. And yeah. right, mm -hmm. if, if you, if you uh, I'm going to yeah. nerd out real quick. If you really think yeah, yeah. about the character Batman, it's this depiction of a person that wears a mask. Mm -hmm. And if you really study the comic lore, Batman is the character. Bruce is the mask. Bruce mm. is just the, the false self, right? The pretend person. So That's it was cool. always uh, something I, I really wanted to embody was that, you know, yeah. maybe the, the billionaire successful like depiction is the mask. So That's Bruce right. became my voice. Got it. And Bruce uh, is a pain in your butt. Oh, all the time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so like from a, a practical tactical place, like, mm -hmm. Why are these conversations with inner child? Why are these conversations with, uh, with our, our voice, whatever the name mm. may be, wh why are they important? Why do they help us? Mm. Why does it matter? Like, why would you even confront all this? Why accept this? Mm. Well, um, you, you probably know that, um, entrepreneurs tend to be pretty forward thinking people. And yeah. And so the, the question is why? Why would I go digging around in my past? Like, why? What's like? Why would exactly, I do that? Yep. Nice. Right. And you know what I always say is that I I do not believe in digging around in your past, but I do believe in paying attention when your past pushes forward into the present. Um, you know, one of the more common things uh, for entrepreneurs is to have ninety eight percent of their life where they can will things to happen. They can will change to happen. They can will success to happen. And then in 2% of their life, these same patterns keep repeating, right? The same relational patterns, these same sort of patterns in business. And no matter what they do, they can't seem to change the way they show up to those particular moments. And for me, that's just a sign that, um, that the past is pushing its way into the present in those moments. So we're not going to go like dredging up a past unnecessarily. We are going to absolutely out of necessity deal with the past as it's showing up in the present where you're reenacting the same pattern over and over again um you know and so for me that was like gosh again i had all the communication tools i had all the skills that i should have been able to use right to produce a really happy peaceful marriage and i was making a total disaster of it because i was showing up in my marriage with needs that were not needs that arose out of my marriage but needs that needs that arose out of my childhood and out of my earlier years, things I brought into the marriage. And, uh, and so those needed to be attended to, um, if I was going to be able to change the present. I think that's crunchy as heck. You know, I, 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 yeah, I find that some of the moments that have been hardest for me to deal with are largely 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. 20 years old. Yeah. And they're, they're just yeah. like a, a reliving of a, of an experience that then, you know, I, t I took off and built something mm -hmm. to try mm -hmm. to cover and protect and defend against. And dude, I can remember getting picked on in like second grade and still to this day, that memory, mm -hmm. I can follow the whole story arc to where that changed yep. what I pursued in college. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And that's that insanity. 
Well, and I think what's unusual there is that you're able to trace the arc. I think a, a lot of us need a little bit of space and time to really be able to, you know, sort of understand the the connections there from second grade to what you're studying in college and so on. You know, and a lot of entrepreneurs get a little bit worried about tinkering with that because, I mean, rightly so, they're like, "Do you unravel?" It's it's produced some pretty good things. Why would I? Why yep. would I tinker with it? It ain't broke. Don't um, fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And what I say is that, you know, successful people cope with their early stresses by drawing upon their greatest strengths, right? We're not going to change your greatest strengths when we start to explore how you coped with your early stresses with those strengths. Um, in fact, we're just going to put you back in charge of those strengths. Now you probably do nice. it compulsively. You're using them in ways that sort of habitually got set for you a long time ago in order to cope. And, uh, and now we're going to put you back in charge to, to decide sort of wisely when you use those strengths and when you can sort of turn them off and go relax instead. Nice. Right? Like that's the, that's the freedom that comes with it. But, um, but no, like, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna erase any strengths that you're coming to the table with. Those are, those are some of the best things about you. This is a strange connection. Uh, I, I think immediately back to back to my comic book origins like this is what what the entire series of x-men was about too right can mm. can you like learn to use your superpower mm. versus right. have just like blast and level buildings mm. where you're mm. not in control and and, and i really resonate I, th I think part of getting out of your own way is is learning to to understand your superpower also to understand your own weaknesses and where you don't have control mm. and where you lose it and getting to a place where you are able to communicate what state you're in. Am I like able to mm. use the superpower right now or am I like getting crushed because I, I'm just like firing without any kind of pause uh, to use the, the phrase we used earlier. Mm. I like that. And, and in some ways, you know, I, I think my journey has been a, a upward, thankfully upward cycle and spiral of, can I get better and better at using my gift? Mm -hmm. But in, in many ways, that also takes a, a significant amount of acceptance of the gift and then denial mm -hmm. of other opportunities. So mm -hmm. the, the place that I'd like to go with this, this conversation mm -hmm. of acceptance is like the push-pull between expanding beyond what is truly something you're great at and, mm -hmm. and just staying narrow. Because every entrepreneur listening is like, Bro, I got FOMO and shiny object syndrome out the wazoo. Totally. But narrowness is important too. Like if your gift is writing, I, I don't know. Do you do you eventually say, well, I'm I'm gonna develop a whole new craft and become an architect? Like, I, I don't know. H how do you <laughs> think about acceptance and width or acceptance and pursuing new things once you really know who you are? Mm, that's so good. Um, I have I have an amazing friend who's an entrepreneur um, who uh, is also a big fan of my work, has attended my my various retreats. <laughs> and he said to me last year, he goes, at the retreat, he goes, um, this is amazing, but I'm never coming to another one again. You need to be writing. <laughs> like, like, I'm not going to enable you. I'm not going to enable you to not focus on your your deepest gift right which i thought was awesome um i'm, I'm pretty convinced I, i'm pretty convinced i can get him to come to another retreat but um but to, to your point right um how how do we give ourselves permission to spend our time in the space where we vibrate the most um and in some ways, trust and surrender that our greatest success, even if we have to redefine what success means, is going to lie down that path, right? Um, I mean, I think that's that's something I have to wrestle with every day because um, I have that entrepreneurial spirit that <laughs> I, I'm the same. I want to do a hundred different things, right? Um, and can we can we stay focused and can we trust and have the clarity that um, the thing that brings us the most joy is the thing? that we're here to do. Um, and, and so give ourselves the, the, the freedom to, to explore that as deeply as we need to. I think that's, I think that's right on. Yep. What, when you think about what's the, what's the fear that comes when, when someone hears that, what's the fear that comes up for people? Do you think? Well, I'll just tell you mine, you know, the, yeah. the, the path of leveraging your gift doesn't always line up with the 
traditional business advice with the, 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 the like world structure with the, the right. demand, the, the game, the social, the money, it doesn't always perfectly adhere to that. Mm-hmm. And so I think the fear I've always had is uh, e- even the fear of launching this podcast, right? Years ago, someone said, dude, you're a conversationalist and you're great at questions. You should start a podcast. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's an inherent part of being a coach too, is asking really good questions that can mm-hmm. help someone see something different. It's, it's really just perspective at, at its yeah. core. Mm-hmm. But the fear has always been what, well, like, then I had to say no to a bunch of other things and where do they take me? And and I sort of end up in this infinite assessment of all mm-hmm. of what could be. And then by trying to articulate mm-hmm. a vision or share like what I want my life to look like and what I imagine and what's possible in all that comes another infinite calculation of how those infinite mm-hmm. paths lead to those infinite options. And then right. you're just in, you're just like paralyzed by that. But the fear is, what if I choose wrong? What if I'm wrong? Right. What if it, what if my gift doesn't right. take me there? What if it can't take me there? Because we have this, yeah. Yeah. you know, economic machine that we also need to play within. So that's such a good, um, so the, over the last couple of years, probably the, the work and the book that's made the biggest difference in my life, um, is a book called the creative act, um, by Rick Rubin, the music producer. And, um, he focuses so much on attunement to our inner energies, attunement to our intuition, attunement to our lungs, attunement to our energy as, as the ultimate guide for the choices that we're making. Um, and I, I can, I totally, in fact, I still, I sort of swing on this pendulum from, um, Oh, there's six doors opening to me right now. And who knows where any of those doors could lead. I don't want to miss out on the opportunities through those doors. And they're all pretty good doors. I could really enjoy, right. Versus slowing. Cause what you're doing then is you're sourcing out your own choices to potential outcomes that haven't even happened yet. Right. And, and outcomes that are, there's so many variables happening between now and that outcome that it's, uh, it's sort of in some ways foolish to even make any decision based upon what outcome one of those things might lead to, um, to, to reclaim and take ownership of your guidance. Um, and this does come with deep self-acceptance and deep self-love to go what, what the tuning fork inside of me resonates with. That's what I'm following. Um, and the amazing thing for me, and I don't, I don't want to get into like a, you know, um, any, any sort of almost like prosperity gospel here, here in the sense that like follow your heart and you know, you'll, but, but I do see it happen over and over. There seems to be something where if we are genuinely listening to that tuning fork, if we've learned how to do it, then joy and abundance comes. Um, but more in more forms than just financial, right. In whole life abundance, whole life sorts of joy. Um, and, and that's been, I mean, that's just my personal story, um, is one in which learning to listen to that tuning fork and following the narrow path of that actually opens up into bigger doors, bigger rooms, bigger opportunities, bigger joy than I, than I could have imagined through those other six doors that looked really intriguing. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. The, the challenge I've always had, and I'm in a season right now where, I'm living the exact opposite of what my challenge has always been. My challenge has always been saying no. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting yep. to me. I, 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 I don't know why this came to mind recently, but there are two, I've said this probably on many other episodes, but it's, it always has such pointed, uh, relevance in the alphabet. There are two words. If you just spell the alphabet mm-hmm. out A to Z first one is high. Second one is no. And to me, that's almost like the secret, right? Can you start uh, a new relationship? Can you begin mm-hmm. something? Can you welcome something? I love and that. then can you set a boundary and divide mm-hmm. and let something go and surrender? Yes. And saying no has always been challenging. I think because of that, that door space is so exciting and so invigorating. And, and mm-hmm. when I look back at little Aaron, childhood Aaron, I wasn't mm-hmm. even invited to the door. 
So now the people right. are like, Hey man, come in, come in this door. Right. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, this is it, man. I'm like, come on, little bro. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And, and yeah. that comes from a place of a wound, yes. not from a place of right. a want. Mm-hmm. And it's been this really interesting, like discovery of, can, can I really understand my motivations to that tuning fork? Can I understand mm-hmm. what I care about? Why, why I'm even intending to go to this place? And then can I shut off mm-hmm. the doors that, that don't fit any longer? And I, I think that if there has been anything that has come from that, that intense focus on the gift and just riding the path and mm-hmm. staying true to the course that I'm on, mm-hmm. it has created a new simplicity, but it has also created uh, the most challenging growth because mm-hmm. I don't have the outlets to run away from it anymore. Like I have to confront and in some ways have conflict mm-hmm. with the vices and the aversions and the avoidances that I used before to justify my lack of commitment. It's just been a <laughs> wild ride of like, <laughs> dude, say wild no ride. and stay committed to your craft. Like commit to your mm. art and stop running. It's really difficult. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I think I told this story in Lovable. Um, long story short, um, it's like one of my earliest memories. So, you know, it's an important one, right? I'm like five years old. Um, and I'm standing in like the entryway to our house and my soccer coach has brought a trophy to the house. Um, and it's a most improved player trophy. Now by all accounts, apparently, (laughs) um, I started out the season standing in the middle of the field. I didn't even like chase in the roaming pack of kids i just stood in the <laughs> middle of the field and turned like i was on a turntable or something just watching nice. right yeah which apparently <laughs> as legend goes was a little embarrassing to my dad it was like a you know state qualifying athlete in several sports and here's his first you know his <laughs> oldest son like just turning in the middle of the field um but by the end of the season apparently i started to run and probably what i was doing was like oh this is how it works and then i was getting to the ball before everybody else because i was doing geometry in my head right mm-hmm. but um but so I get, I, I, I get handed this most improved player trophy and it's like the first moment, it's the first memory of my life. Right. And it's this amazing moment, amazing moment of being honored. Um, but I also think one of the reasons I remember it is I learned a, a sort of a painful lesson in that moment, which is, you know, when you just stand there and you just be you, we're not we're not very interested in you and we're a little embarrassed, but when you start to run and chase and achieve and compete and accomplish, Oh man, you've got our attention. Oh boy. We'll bring you trophies and we'll all gather around you and we'll all celebrate you and glow. Um, well, you made me think of the story when you talked about like so much of what we do is a pursuit of belonging. Right. And, and what I learned that day is that if you're just you, not sure how much you belong, but if you, if you're competing and running through all six doors at once and chasing it all, that then you'll belong to us. And we have to learn that we belong exactly the way we are at the beginning of the day, having done nothing with a totally clean slate, we belong. And there are people out there who will want to belong to us in that state. And then everything else we do for the rest of the day is totally icing on the cake. And if we aren't if we aren't proceeding from that self-awareness and that self-knowledge and that self-trust, then we are scrambling for something that we will not earn through any of those six doors. We just won't find it there. And we're eventually going to have to come back and find it in ourselves and with our people anyways. So, um, yeah. So I think that's, that drives a lot of it, drives it for me, drives it for a lot of the entrepreneurs you and I work with. We're, we're searching for something that we have to find back, back here at home. What a, what a fascinating part of being human. You know, I know. And to, like, it's like that, I, I would never change that moment either. Right. Like it was so sweet. Yeah. It was really, he was a volunteer coach, probably like a parent of another player. I don't know. Like, and I'm glad my parents were excited for me that I, I you know, was accomplishing something, but we're just going to have to, um, we're just going to have to battle that, that sort of constant message of, of the world that says when you're running, you're valuable. And when you're, when you're watching, you're not, um, mm. cause we just got to start with watching before we start running. Yeah. I, I really resonate deeply resonate with that. And that, that kind of dovetails into an interesting 
segue and question. I think part of lovability that has been challenging around saying no has has been the context of a boundary. So uh, mm-hmm. I'll give you some backdrop on this before the question itself. For a long time, the the conversation of boundaries existed in like personal relationships, but it, mm-hmm. really the place I learned it better was business. Hmm. When I started uh, my, it was my second comp, uh, yeah, second company. It was a nonprofit, and a lot of that work was designed to be philanthropic and be giving. But after a lot of work and hmm. not a lot of fiscal support. All the money went back into the business. I took very little out. And I started to build this resentment for what I was doing. Like I was mm-hmm. giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and mm-hmm. uh, getting. And then giving and giving and giving. And it was just like this really unequitable equation. Mm-hmm. So we had to level the playing field a little bit and, and try to make it a bit more uh, more fluid from a giving mm-hmm. perspective. Could I give more? I was running out of the capacity to do that. So there had to be some mm-hmm. fluidity that that was built in. I had to take on more. I had to say yes to more. I had to raise our prices. Had to do all that. We delivered value, mm-hmm. but we weren't getting value back. So that when that started yeah. to change, it taught me an interesting lesson about boundaries in business. And over the last yeah. uh, that was like eight years ago, last eight years, boundaries in business have have changed a lot. Where it might be a pricing conversation, or it might be, mm-hmm. hey, I'm I'm not going to spend my time coming to that event, or I, I can't speak at that that. Uh, expo or I I can't travel for this. Like Mm -hmm. it's changed a lot, but most of the place that originated from was I'm going to say no for you. Hmm. And and I thought that I really had boundaries figured out. And what I've since Hmm. learned is that, uh, and this is, this ties back to lovability too, like that my lovability and my acceptance of myself is, is predicated on my ability to just protect me. And that boundaries mm. aren't really about anyone else. They're they're just mm. about me. And can can yeah. I love myself enough to say no? Hey, I, yeah, I don't want to come this different. weekend. Can I just say no? I just deserve a little mm-hmm. weekend time for myself. Or oh, yeah. hey, I'm going to say no to this because look, I know I can take on more clients, but I don't I don't have the capacity right now. Like I've got mm-hmm. a lot of other things moving in my life, and I need to honor where I'm at. And that creates an interesting conflict with the world. Mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. really healthy, but it, mm-hmm. it creates conflict nonetheless. And conflict is a big part of change as it is acceptance. So mm-hmm. I'm really curious to get your take on, mm-hmm. you know, as someone gets better at accepting themselves and they're able to to do this in their, in their life and their relationships and their business with their time, what they can expect when it comes to healthy conflict, because conflict can be healthy. I think it should be healthy. Right. But there's this right. expectation that when you set boundaries, like you get a parade and people like cherish your <laughs> nose and they're like, oh my God, man, I totally love your boundary, bro. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it don't work like that. So what, Those what are can what someone expect when I start say. to do that? <laughs> if someone <laughs> yes. says that, make them a best friend and don't ever let yes. them, right? Don't ever <laughs> yes. let them go. That's yeah. amazing. Um, yeah. Well, you use an important word there I, in these two words, boundaries and resentment. You often hear them mentioned in the same breath. Um, I, I often say that resentment is a boundary that you didn't set 10 minutes ago. Um, and, and so when, and it's interesting, we don't talk a lot about resentment, but we all seem to know what we mean by that word. It's, it is amazing. We all use it in the same way. And, and so if you're noticing resentment toward anyone about anything, it's just a really nice red flag to say, slow down. Um, there was a boundary that probably your true self wanted to set a while ago, maybe 10 minutes ago, maybe 10 days ago, 10 months ago. Um, and you blew past it, uh, for probably a number of reasons that it will be good for you to pay attention to. Um, but whenever someone mentions to me that, that they're feeling resentful, I'm like, Oh man, I think that's your soul speaking up saying that it it deserves to be cared for and you're not taking care of it. So let's, let's pay attention to what that resentment is saying. Um, and you're dead on, that um i would say that most most poor boundaries are an attempt to manage a tenuous sense of belonging like if i if i actually advocate for myself and what i need 
you're not going to stick around or you're going to be upset with me or there's going to be conflict. There's going to be pushback. I don't know if I'll be able to hold the boundary if you push back on me. Um, there's a sense, there's a sense that you keep me around because I'm sort of like, I'm sort of squishy and turn, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm malleable. I'll sort of, I'll be an extension of you. I'll do what you need me to do. I'll do what you want me to do. Um, and so I, I do believe a lot of boundary work comes back to that belonging issue again. Um, and the question of, can you know that you are going to be okay if this person is really upset at you for speaking up for yourself? Um, are you, do you know that you do have places you belong in the world if this place of belonging can't support the boundaries that you're, you're discerning and setting? Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're, I just think you're right on there. I think we have to be prepared, um, to, to sort of navigate that there, there's a, um, a sort of a, a joke that I tell in, in lovable. I got this from a, a theologian and philosopher named Peter Rollins he tells this joke about this guy who goes to the, um, goes to a psychoanalyst and says, um, Hey doc, I, I think I'm chicken feet on the ground and it's just a terrifying way to live. Can I, can you help me out? And the psychoanalyst says, sure. You know, sees him five days a week for a few years and finally declares him cured. He says, you know who you are. You know, you're a human being, you know, you're not chicken feet on the ground. I discharge you. So the guy graduates from psychoanalysis and then a week later calls up the psychoanalyst and says, doctor, I got to see you right away. There's neighbors who moved in next door and they've got chickens. And the doctor says, well, what's the problem? You, you know, you know, you're not chicken feet on the ground. He says, I know I'm not chicken feet on the ground, but do the chickens know? And, and, <laughs> and I, I share that story in lovable because I think it captures this really um, scary feeling middle ground between worthiness and belonging, right? Where mm. we know we are worthy of setting a boundary for ourselves, but do the chickens know, or are they going to peck at us right, when right. we, when we set that boundary, when we say, I deserve some time away, I deserve to do this. I deserve to take a break. Well, why, what do you got that weekend? You had a funeral? No, I'm actually just going for a hike. <laughs> what? You can't, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Yeah, no, I deserve a hike. I I'm, I'm going to go look at leaves. Like, um, and, and so I, I do think that that is sort of the big challenge as we've really learned to trust that we're lovable and we're worthy is that when we start to speak up for ourselves, people will have reactions and we have to navigate that. Dang. Dang. That's so good, man. I, I love that parable. I don't know if that's what you would call it, but story parable. And it's a great story. Like when he told, when he, yeah. told, when he told that story, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what it's like. It's like, it, you know, and, and I, and, and I think there, there are a lot of us, this is, I think this is an important piece, um, because so much of, of learning that we're lovable, um, and trusting that we're worthy is an inside job. A lot of us would like to stop there. Like, okay, I know I'm, I'm worthy. But the reality is we're wired for relationship. We're wired for belonging. We're wired to show up and show people who we are and have people celebrate us and, and accept us and, and enjoy us. And so, um, we have to sort of cross that, what feels like a little bit of a dangerous chasm there, not knowing who's actually going to be excited for us and who we are. Um, and that comes back mm -hmm. to that kind of that, you know, comment about if somebody celebrates your boundaries, that's who you belong to. Yeah. That's, I've seldom gotten that. I have gotten that, but very seldom. And I've, I celebrate it as much as I celebrate myself for declaring the boundary. Well, and uh, in full disclosure, I, I have in the last probably two years, I've continued to grow significant. You can't set a boundary until you know what you want, right? Till you know, and, and I have grown significantly in my self-awareness of what I want and what I, what I need, uh, in terms mm -hmm. of personal self-care and that kind of thing. And so I've been setting and I've, and I've, and I've really owned it. Like I feel really good about it. I feel at peace with it, which means I've been setting boundaries pretty matter of factly with my wife that she's never heard from me before. Right. Like, oh yeah, sorry, babe. No, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> and, and it turns out after like six months of that, she's like, I don't like this. I, I, I just, I, I, this isn't working for me. Right. Um, I changed some patterns in our relationship and, um, and I, and, and to be honest, I didn't, 
I wasn't attentive enough to the impact that that was having on her. Um, mm. And so we've had to do some significant recalibration here in the last couple of months. Um, and, and I share that story to say that um, this is not about deciding what are your boundaries and then surrounding yourself only with people who love them, right? It's also learning how to navigate your boundaries with the people who love you. That's, that's a yeah. thing too. Um, she support, supported me more than anybody else in my whole life. And my current boundaries are a struggle for her. So we got to navigate that together. We have to participate in that together. Sounds like healthy conflict. And it, healthy the, conflict. the process of healthy conflict, right? I, I absolutely think, um, I, you know, I would define healthy conflict as um, open-hearted communication about hard things, right? Nice. Unhealthy conflict is when we close our hearts and we get into defensive mode and we go in attack mode and we hide and we withdraw and we try to control the other person. But like open-hearted communication about things that aren't working for us, that's healthy conflict. And it's so important to to get there. Like we we do some work with a couple of different companies, and I'd say many of the companies we coach the number one and the number two. And there's an appropriate amount of tension that's needed in that relationship to guide mm -hmm. an organization to success. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we've we've sort of found three phases. There's there's unhealthy peace is phase one. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. oh yeah it's fine. Yep. Oh it's cool. Right Resentment one oh one right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then it shifts yeah, right. into unhealthy conflict. So mm -hmm. it has to escalate because you've had this falsified peace. Then it has to escalate mm -hmm. to unhealthy conflict where it is just yep. gross and unfun. And then, and only then can it get to sort of the, the goal, mm -hmm. the primordial one of healthy conflict. But it's, that. it's like yeah. such a journey to do that. And mm -hmm. I, I find that organizations that really want to grow, entrepreneurs that really want to grow, ha have to kind of go through that within themselves and with their team if they really want to hit the the home run. Uh, yes, you know a lot of that interestingly comes from the dynamics that are in business, and I, I think this is an interesting way to to sort of wind our way down. When, when we have an organization at the forefront of our lives, I have mm -hmm. struggled with even the things like, I want to have a morning routine, or I don't want to answer calls until 10, or like some of these things mm -hmm. that I should inherently be able to quote unquote control mm -hmm. because I might be the person in charge or the owner or an owner or what have you. Mm -hmm. But then I struggle with like, how do I do that? And I'd say if there's a if there if there's a pattern that we help the most mm -hmm. in with entrepreneurs, it's the place of like my ecosystem does not match up with who I want to be. It, it doesn't, mm -hmm. and the reason it doesn't is because I, I I just I'm perpetuating the same cycle. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So I just keep on cycling through, and it's unhealthy conflict with my number two, or it's it's healthy mm -hmm. peace, or it's unhealthy peace, like. It just mm -hmm. grows. I don't have the time I want in the morning. I can't hire because then in the way that you said it, I wouldn't belong. The The belonging of the business would change. Mm -hmm. So it, it just becomes this like wall that's closing in around us on all four mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. And, and yep. I find that whether it's the relationship with the one or two, or it's the relationship with the entre entrepreneur with themselves, there has to be a confrontation of like, is this what I want? And is this going mm. to get us the kind of vulnerability and open heartedness that ultimately yields the life that is open hearted? Cause yeah. I think we all kind of want that. I think you've set a really good stage for, um, a culture of, um, sort of open hearted conversation around resentment. Honestly, like I, I think that could be a really healthy kind of conversation to be having. Um, you know, Number one in the organization ought to be able to say, "Hey, when this happens, it causes me to be resentful." Um, and I, I should be I should be clear here. Like, I think we always want to be as much as we can pushing the limits of what we're willing to do before we hit resentment. Right? This isn't like camping out and like, um, you know, oh, you, you know, you, you called me during my spa treatment, and you know, I mean, like, we 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 want we want to push the limits of what we're capable of doing for our people, but acknowledge what our current limits are, 
without getting resentful. I'll give you an example. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Um, this is personal, but um, I'm, um, it's a Sunday morning. This is maybe a year ago. My wife is in a different town running a, a, a triathlon. Um, <laughs> we're signed up to do the Bible reading at church. And, uh, and I'm the last person who wants to do that. It's supposed to be my wife who does it, but okay. So like she's at a triathlon. My daughter's sick, so she's not going to go to church. My middle son has work, so he's going to work. And here I am. I'm the only one going to church to do the Bible reading. And I'm, I'm owning it. Like this, this feels like a little bit beyond my typical boundaries, but I'm taking care of a sick kid. My wife's gone. I'm, I'm transferring another kid to work and I'm going to church to read the Bible for the the church and the family. And, and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm like, I feel, I'm feeling good about this. It's, it's consistent with who I want to be as a father and a husband. Day goes on. I'm managing various different things with the kids in the household. My son says, okay, I need a ride home from work. So I go to pick him up. He gets in the car and he says, Hey, Jace needs a ride home. Can we take him? And I just feel it happen inside. I'm like, I said, I just said to him, I go, I, I can't. I, I will resent that in an hour. Like I, I just can tell that I'm at my limit of what I can do for people right now without starting to get into that resentful place. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, like Jace deserves to walk anyways. He stayed up all night playing video games and that's why he doesn't arrive. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. It's sort of funny, but, um, but like what a, what an opportunity amongst leadership to say, where's the place where I start? You know, what's the thing that triggers me to go, Ooh, I'm going to resent this tomorrow, right? What's the thing for you? How can we support you to craft a life of leadership in this organization that doesn't trigger your resentment all the time? Um, and don't like, there are probably all sorts of op options and iterations of what we could be doing here that makes room enough for everybody to have their boundaries to not build their resentment. Um, but it does require really open-hearted communication to do it. And as you know, that that's a, that's, that's something that's tough to master in and of itself. So what, how would you describe the difference between servant leadership and that? Because I think there mm. is a very thin line between like, Hey, I'm here to help you. I'm the bottom. Like I, I, I think the, the leader of the organization has to be the bottom of the, the pyramid mm. and, and an upside down triangle, right? Like things, yes. I'm here to help you. I'm here to make sure you're successful. And also yes. that like, Hey, I can't help you today is important. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that, it's that reality that oftentimes we just assume that servants don't have limits and like that they're somehow mm. not a human person with just with limits, you know, um, in my faith tradition, we just got done celebrating a big holiday Easter, you know, life of Jesus, um, arguably one of the, um, most well-known servants in human history. You, you read that man's story over and over and over again, he's setting limits. He's setting boundaries. He's going, nope, I'm going off to a quiet place by myself. No, I will not heal you. I've done too much healing today. No, I don't want to talk to all of you. I'm going to go in a boat over here. Like It's just over and over and over again. <laughs> so the idea that somehow we're going to have fewer limits than Jesus, I think is a, 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 little, bit, a little bit of an audacious, ambitious um, sort of agenda. Um, we have, And this goes back to that self-acceptance to come full circle. What are my limits right now? How far can I go in serving people without starting to resent those people? And you are not going to be able to change those limits overnight. So if they're your limits, you got to respect them. Hmm. Man. I, I, I love the full circle moment there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've, the acceptance of that. Yeah. If I really yeah. think back to uh, running where we started and my reading a lovable, one, one of the... I'm just kind of gathering this this right now. One of the things that happened during that run, I, I would run so hard and so aggressively because I couldn't transmute my emotions into words. Mm -hmm. So I would transmute transmute them into like physicality, mm -hmm. and I could understand emotional pain through physical pain. I could just run until I like my abs hurt, my legs hurt, and that would give me a sense of understanding of what was happening emotionally. And I think in a way reading and pausing during the middle of that run was also about me accepting that like I, I just couldn't run at the pace mm. that I wanted to. The ground was slippery and wet and like it it was so interesting. It is you very could interesting feel to yourself, right now. You could feel yourself pushing yourself past a yeah. healthy safe limit for you. Yeah. Yeah. And and reading that book on that run that day, that weather, that sunshine, that like little 
glistening glimmer with the leaves on the ground was a moment of, I have to just accept that I can't run the way that I might want to. And dude, I had this, just this yesterday morning, Monday morning, it was, it was Easter weekend. Uh, my oldest, my 20 year old who we hadn't seen in three months cause he's off chasing his dream of becoming a professional comedian in Chicago. Um, talk about having to like relinquish control of your people and accept, right. When he, in eighth grade, he's like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to become a comedian. And sure enough, he's off there doing it. But so we don't get to see him much. He doesn't come home like a normal college kid, right? He comes home when he can get a few days off work. So he's home for Easter Saturday night. He asked me to play some ping pong. Um, and we play well past my bedtime, but he's 20 and he lives in the city. So it's like his night's just getting started. And he's, he says he lays his paddle down on the table where we you know, toss the ping pong ball. If we land on the paddle, we get to serve first, puts the paddle on the table. He goes to another one. And I checked in with myself and I'm like, I can't do it. I got to go to bed. I'm utterly exhausted as much as I would love to, to play with you. I've got to, I've got to go to bed. So we go through Sunday then. Monday morning, I'm down in the basement exercising, and I look over, and the paddle is still sitting there on the on the table. And my first thought is, why didn't you play one more game with him? Why didn't you play one more game with him? And the answer that came back was, because you were at your limit. Like, and and the whole thing is, I, honestly, I just started to weep um, at my limits, at what it means to accept my limits the fact that I would have loved to have played one more game, but I literally didn't have it in me and I needed to respect that. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think this is a really rich conversation that you've, you've created here around self-acceptance around limits around, yeah, I could go through all six doors, but what's, what's it going to do to me? Um, you're really like encouraging the listeners to find the subtleties and the nuance in self-love versus achievement and accomplishment. Um, and in, in doing so, you are going to actually help them find a sustainable way to do what they love to do with their lives and to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And sustainability and peacefulness in doing it is everything. So I just, I just, I'm, I'm a bit in awe of the quality of the conversation you created here. Hmm. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I do hope that anyone tuned in can find a sustainable way to do what they love. If there is anything that I would like to perpetuate, it would be the belief that that can be done and can be done in an economically, mm. in a mentally, in a spiritually, and in an emotionally congruent way. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Doc, this was awesome. Damn. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. <laughs> Such an empowering conversation. Thank you for making time today. Uh, yeah, blessing. Thanks, blessing to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Aside from people going to buy Lovable, which you should do immediately, yeah. uh, where can people uh, first? Let's get your other books out sure. by name, and then where can people learn more about you? Follow your Substack and your writing. Yeah. Yeah. Lovable is my first book, uh, embracing what is truest about you. So you can truly embrace your life. And then, um, true companions, a book for everyone about the relationships that see us through is really to me, an homage to the, the, the meaningfulness of belonging and companionship. Um, and then I wrote a novel, the unhiding of Elijah Campbell. Now people tell me that, um, the experience you had while, while listening to lovable is one they also have while reading the novel. Um, and, uh, it's that it's moving in some, some really important ways. So I would encourage folks, I call it functional fiction. Like it will actually inspire you and equip you to live a more authentic life. Um, and so encourage people to check that out. And then right now I'm doing all of my public writing on Substack. Um, some of you may have heard of Substack burgeoning social media, eh, not social media platform, burgeoning content platform, um, for people who, who love to write. And, uh, and so it's at Dr. Kelly Flanagan dot Substack dot com. Um, and you can subscribe for free, or if you want access to sort of our paid community, it's a pretty low, low subscription rate. I would encourage buy all the things, do all the things. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> pay pay attention to to Dr. Kelly Flanagan. This is uh, just one of many conversations I've gotten to have, and each of them are equally, whether they are short or long, as deep. Uh, Kelly, I'm I'm grateful that we've we've been able to have as many as we have. I hope they continue. Mm. This has been it is a blessing. I can awesome. I can 
I can feel like I, I'm going out to my family now for the rest of the evening. This is the end of my work day, so to speak. Um, and I can feel how m- much I'm going to show up to them with presence and appreciation and yet attunement to myself as a result of this conversation. So it is a blessing to me to have sort of centered into this before I get to, to reconnect with the family. Thank you, man. To hell a compliment. Uh, thanks for helping me with just your writing, your stories. Thanks for helping our listeners get out of their own way. Sounds like you and I have a lot in common with the way we're helping people. And I'm, I don't know, I'm feeling super grounded, super blessed to just share the stage with you here. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thank you.